Good morning, good morning. Today we don't have a speaker. Um, I was actually uh, just kind of browsing the internet looking for uh, testimonies, and I found a testimony that uh, I thought was really powerful, and so actually I wanted to share it with, uh, with you guys today. So it's, uh, it takes place in a, a Christian school uh, up north. Uh, he's speaking in chapel to students. It would be very similar to us um, videotaping a, a speaker and then just putting it on the internet, and so I found it. Um, his name's Christopher Yon, um, and, uh, and so it's about 30, 30 minutes, so it's going to go a little bit longer than chapel. Once we're done, you're going to be dismissed, so I'm going to pray with us up front. Um, it's just a very, uh, very fascinating testimony that he gives uh, on how he became a believer, um, and so I just uh, would ask that you guys just sit back and uh, listen to what, what he has to say, and I'll, I'll pray for us, and then once it's done, we're just going to be dismissed for, for class, okay? Heavenly Father, I thank you for these opportunities where we can come together. Uh, I pray that the testimony we're about to hear will, uh, will penetrate the heart of, of students, that they will hear uh, the truth in it, Lord God, and that your Holy Spirit will just do a work in, in the lives of our students uh, and that they'll be able to connect with, with what they're about to hear. Uh, just watch, watch over us as we go out and go through the rest of the day. Uh, we pray that everything we do will glorify and honor you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. How are you? Good. Well, I thought I would share my testimony a little bit uh, with you this morning and about my journey of faith and how it touches on the issue of sexuality. Later on, I'm going to teach a little bit about a Christian response to homosexuality and then also about nature nurtures is something that you're born with or not. So if, you're, uh, if you don't have anything going on at that time, uh, you can come uh, to that. Well, I was born in Chicago, not in a Christian home though. So I didn't go to church, didn't go to a nice Christian school, uh, didn't go to Wana, you know, have all the Bible drills or, you know, whatever you call them, sword drills, uh, stuff like that. So I, I didn't know anything, uh, that, that whole culture. But my parents raised me with very traditional Chinese values. How many Asians do we have here? Any Asians here? <laughs> nice, all right, we got one, one Asian here, another one studying over here, no, two, three, okay, a few Asians here, yeah. All right, we're, we're slowly taking over, okay, just in case, you know, the, the Asian invasion. Um, so, well, in, in case you didn't know about, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the what, what, you know, ch ch traditional Chinese values, well, let me fill you in on these Chinese values. First of all, you must obey your parents. Second, do well in school. Third, you got to practice piano. See, I never, you know, it's either piano, violin, one or the other. Um, I never fit in with the other American boys. Obviously, I looked different. I acted different. I had different interests. God had given me the... <laughs> Y'all never say that when I walk up here. What's up with that? <laughs> you know, it's all downhill from there anyway. Well... Uh, so, but God had given me the gifts of music, of sensitivity, and Satan, who can't take away those God-given gifts, can twist the perception of them. And from a young age, I was viewed and ridiculed as being effeminate. The first time I remember having same-sex attraction was when I was nine years old, after I came across pornography at a friend's house. And at that young age, I was confused and afraid of those feelings. Without any parental guidance on sexuality, those magazines gave me a distorted view of sex, and they soon became my master. So with pornography fueling my same-sex attractions, I had my first encounter when I was 16 years old. But I kept my feelings hidden through high school, college, and even the Marine Corps Reserve. Then when I moved to Louisville, Kentucky, I started dental school, pursuing my doctorate in dentist, uh, dentistry. And that's when I finally came out of the closet and I began living openly as a gay man. So I decided to break the news to my parents and I told them, I am gay. Well, my mom just devastated my mom who wasn't yet a Christian and she actually thought that an ultimatum could bring me to my senses. And she said, you must either choose the family or choose homosexuality. Well, I had already bought into the lie that this was the core of who I thought I was. And besides, I thought, well, I couldn't turn it on and off like a light switch. And, I have, and, be, and if you can't accept me for who, you are, for who I am, I have no other choice but to leave. And I left home and I went back to Louisville. Well, this crushed my mother who wasn't yet a Christian. And she uh, was, you know... This, she says, news of my death would have been better than receiving this news. Timing couldn't have been any, any worse. 
After years of living as non-Christians, my parents' marriage was a disaster, and they actually began the paperwork for a divorce. So my mom was literally at the end of a rope, and she found no more reason to live. And on the next day, she had resolved to do the unthinkable. And she was going to end her life. So my mother bought a one-way Amtrak ticket to Louisville, where she planned to say to get out the goodbye to, to me for the very last time before ending it all. But for some reason, she felt the need to go see a minister. And this minister gave her a pamphlet on homosexuality. And with only her purse and that pamphlet, she boarded on the train thinking that, that death was the only answer to her problem. Never being much of a reader, she began reading this pamphlet, which shared with her the plan of salvation, that all of us are sinners, and yet, in spite of our sin, the God of the universe still loves us. And God opened up the eyes of her heart to see that just as God can love her in spite of her sin, she could love me, her gay son. So on this train, my mother gave her life to Christ. So, and then within a few months, my father did as well. You see, my mom actually went to Louisville expecting to end her life. And in reality, she did. One of her favorite verses today is Galatians 2.20. For I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Christ living in them prepared my parents for the difficult years ahead as I headed deeper and deeper into the world of homosexuality. Spending most of my free time in the gay clubs, I went from relationship to relationship, seeking intimacy and happiness, which I found temporarily, but it only left me feeling unfulfilled and unsatisfied. So I began experimenting with drugs, but without much money as a dental student, I supported my habit by selling drugs, and I sold to friends, classmates, and even a professor. Not something I'd suggest. You see, I actually thought I could live this double life of being a graduate student by day and a promiscuous drug dealer by night. But three months before I was to receive my doctorate, the administration expelled me. So my parents flew down from Chicago to Louisville, Kentucky. My father's a dean. Um, my, my father's a dentist. He knew the dean really well. And I thought they were going to fight to keep me in school because isn't that what any good Asian parent would do? Well, to my surprise, as we sat there in the dean's office... My mother looked at the dean and said, it's not important that Christopher becomes a dentist. What's more important is that Christopher becomes a Christ follower. And they said that they're going to support whatever decision the school made. I wasn't too happy about that decision. They weren't on my side, they were on the school side. So I moved further away from them, further away from Chicago to the bright lights and big city of Atlanta, Georgia. And there I quickly took over the drug scene in the gay community and I became a supplier to other dealers in over a dozen states. In addition, it was nothing for me to have multiple anonymous sexual encounters each and every day. Because according to the world, I had it all. Money, fame, drugs, and sex. I had exchanged the truth of God for a lie and began worshiping and serving the creature rather than the creator. Because in my world, I had become God. My parents had no idea that I was doing drugs or even selling drugs, but they knew my biggest need was to know Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. So they tried to reach out to me with the love of Christ, and I wanted nothing to do with it. My mother would send me Christian cards like, every other day like clockwork she would get this big stack of christian cards you know you get the, at the christian bookstore you ever notice how they're always so feminine you know like cute and little bunnies rabbits you know kittens and they're never any masculine like manly christian cards right you know like blood stuff blowing up you know fire dirt big machines anyway I, I think we need some manly christian cards but she would take these cards and fill it in with paragraphs of scripture and on the back, she would write in her favorite hymn of the week, all 27 verses. And on the bottom of every card, she signed it, love you forever, mom. And I'd never read those cards and simply toss them in the trash. So my parents uh, thought, well, the only way they'd be able to see, to see me was if they actually flew to Atlanta. And they did, but after the second day, I told them to get out. And, I, you know, they weren't preaching at me, but just the fact that God had so transformed their lives that they radiated Christ, that in itself was offensive to me, and I told them to get out. And I didn't even give them an opportunity to call up their friends to pick them up. 
but before my father left, he wanted to give me something. And in his very first Bible, had the notes in the margins, it was all dog-eared. And I told my dad, I don't want your Bible. Because I didn't even want him to think that I actually might read it. But my father left it on my kitchen counter anyway and walked out the door. And as soon as they left, I took my dad's Bible and I threw it in his trash can. I wanted nothing to do with God, nothing to do with their religion, and nothing to do with the Bible. And after that visit, it was more than obvious to my parents that I was totally unreachable and completely hopeless. But my parents committed not to focus on the hopelessness, but upon the promises of God. And along with over 100 prayer warriors from the church, from the Bible study fellowship groups, they began to cry out to God for me. My mother began to pray a very bold prayer, which was, God, do whatever it takes to bring this prodigal son to you. That's a bold prayer for a mother to make, but she was desperate. And in her desperation, she fasted every Monday for seven years and once fasted 39 days on my behalf. She would literally spend hours every morning in her prayer closet interceding on my behalf. She knew that it would take nothing short of a miracle to bring this prodigal son to the Father. And a miracle is exactly what God did. This miracle came one day with a bang on my door. I opened up my door, and on my front doorstep were 12 federal drug enforcement agents, Atlanta police, and two big German shepherd dogs. I just received a large shipment of drugs, not my largest, but they confiscated all my money and my drugs, and I was charged with the street value equivalent of 9.1 tons of marijuana. With that amount, I was facing 10 years to life in federal prison. I had started with a bright future among society's finest in academia, and I found myself in the ditch among society's despised in Atlanta City Detention Center. So I tried calling all my friends. You know those type of friends that say, whenever you need something, just give me a call. Those friends that get me more into trouble than they're any good for me. You know what I mean. Well, my mom knew as long as I had those type of friends around, I would find no need for God and no need for my parents. And remember, she loves bold prayers. Well, she prayed specifically that somehow, some way, God would cause all of my friends to desert me. And on that day, not one friend answered my collect call. So beware of your mother's prayers. They're going to come true. So I was at the bottom of the list, home, and I did not want to make that phone call. As I imagined the earful that I was going to get on the other line. But my mother's first words were, Son, are you okay? No condemnation, no braiding words, just words of unconditional love and grace. The Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 2, verse 4, that it's God's kindness that leads us to repentance. It's not God's wrath, it's not God's anger. But it's God's kindness that leads us to repentance. And even on that miserable day, God was pouring out his grace and drawing me to himself through the words of my mother. Actually, my mom was excited to get that phone call, if you can believe it or not. Because I hadn't called home in years. And she knew without a doubt that this was God's answer to her prayers. So she hung up that phone, fighting back to tears. She knew she had to do just as that good old hymn says. Count your blessings. Name them one by one. No matter what storm she was going through, no matter what heartache she was enduring, she had to count her blessings. So she set the phone down and reached out for a little piece of adamant sheet tape and she wrote down these first blessings. Christopher is in a safe place compared to before and he called home for the very first time as my years in prison passed she kept adding to this list of blessings and taping more pieces of adamantine tape to it 
And today, this list of blessings is longer and taller than she is. Let's pray. Three days later, as I was walking around the cell block, I passed by this garbage can and I thought, as I looked at the trash, I thought, my life is so much like this trash. I'm from upper middle class suburb of Chicago. My father has two doctorates. I was on my way to become a doctor. I had it made. But now I found myself among common criminals. Trash. And with my head down, I was about to pass by this garbage can. But something on top of the trash caught my eye. I bent over, picked it up, and it was a Gideon New Testament. I took the New Testament back to my cell and I opened up that good book for the first time. And I read through the entire Gospel of Mark that night. But let me tell you something. I did not think that this was going to be the answer to all my problems. I thought, I've got an enormous amount of time on my hands and I better pass it somehow. But as many of you know, what we have in our Bibles is not just ink or paper. But what we have in our Bibles, beloved, is the very breath of God. And it is living and powerful and sharper than any double-edged sword if you come through the hardest of hearts exposing my sin, my rebellion, and it wasn't a pretty sight. And I thought things couldn't get any worse. I was wrong. A couple weeks later, I was called in the nurse's office. They handcuffed me, chained my hands around my waist, shackled my feet together. I shuffled in the nurse's office. She shut the door behind me, sat me down, and I knew something wasn't right. She was uncomfortably struggling with the words. She couldn't even give me eye contact. So she resigned to writing something on a piece of paper and slowly slid it across the desk to me. I looked down at this piece of paper, and I saw three letters and a symbol. It read H I V. days after, the dark and lonely, I was sentenced to six years, certainly much better than ten years to life, but news of my HIV status felt like a death sentence. One night as I was laying in my bed, I noticed in the metal bunk above me something scribbled. And it read, if you're bored, read Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. You see, at the most hopeless point in my life, God was using the words penned by a prophet thousands of years ago to a rebellious nation to tell me that regardless of who I was and what I had done in the past, he still had a plan for me. I had no idea where this plan was going to take me, but God gave me enough faith, enough strength to get through that one day and the next. My transformation was gradual. Wish I, could, wish I could say I got down on my knees, said the sinner's prayer, and everything was just perfect after that, but that's far from the truth. God was convicting me my, de my dependencies. The most obvious was drugs. But within a few months, he completely delivered me from that. But the last thing that I was holding on to was my sexuality. As I was reading the Bible, I couldn't get around the fact that God loved me unconditionally, but I also came across those passages that seemed to condemn that core part of who I thought I was, my sexuality. So I went to a prison chaplain and I asked him his opinion on this issue. And to my surprise, this prison chaplain actually told me that the Bible does not condemn homosexuality. And he gave me a book explaining that view. So with much curiosity, I took that book in the hopes of finding biblical justification for homosexuality. 
I had that book in one hand and the Bible in the other. And from a purely human perspective, I had every reason in the world to accept what that book was claiming to justify the way I had been living. But God's indwelling Holy Spirit convicted me that those assertions from that book were a clear distortion of God, His Word, and His unmistakable condemnations against homosexual behavior. I couldn't even finish that book, and I gave it back to the chaplain. So I turned to the Bible alone. I went through every verse, every chapter, every page of Scripture looking for justification for homosexuality, looking for anything, looking for justification for monogamous, adult, consensual, homosexual relationships. I never found any. So I was at a turning point, and the decision had to be made. Either abandon God and His Word to live as a gay man by allowing my sexuality to dictate who I was. Or... Abandon homosexuality and pursuing gay relationships by liberating myself from my feelings and sexuality and live as a follower of Jesus Christ. My decision was clear and obvious. I chose God. As the days and the weeks and the months of abstinence passed, I realized that my sexuality should not be the core of who I was. See, my sexual inclinations are not inseparable from who I am as a person. My feelings do not control me. I used to tell myself that God loves me unconditionally, but he doesn't want me to change. But actually, I realize that unconditional love is not the same thing as unconditional approval of my behavior. See, my identity should never be defined just by my feelings. My identity should not be grounded only in my sexuality. My identity is not gay, homosexual, or even, get this, or even heterosexual for that matter. Because my identity as a child of the living God must be in Jesus Christ alone. God says, be holy for I am holy. I had always thought that the opposite of homosexuality was heterosexuality. But actually, the opposite of homosexuality is holiness. God never said, be heterosexual, for I am heterosexual. But neither, neither did he say, be homosexual, for I am homosexual. God said, be holy, for I am holy. And he's tell me, don't focus upon your sexuality or your feelings or your temptations, your desires, but Focus upon living a life of holiness and living a life of purity. Because change is not the absence of struggle. But change is the freedom to choose holiness in the midst of our struggles. Let me say that again. Change is not the absence of struggles. When does God ever promise us that we won't be tempted with our sin? But change is the freedom to choose holiness in the midst of our struggles. Because the ultimate issue is not what I'm struggling with. The ultimate issue is not my feelings, temptations, not my sexuality. But the ultimate issue is that I yearn after God in total surrender and complete obedience. As I began to live this life of surrender, this life of obedience, God began to reveal his plan for my life. And he called me to full-time ministry while I was in prison. And I realized that it didn't matter where I was, whether in prison or out of prison, because my calling on life will remain the same regardless of the location. And with that change of heart, God did another miracle, and he shortened my sentence from six years to three years, which is almost unheard of in the federal system. So with only about a year left of my prison sentence, I knew if I was going to continue on in ministry, I'd better learn more about the Bible than just prison religion. So I called home, collected my parents, and I told them about my interest to go to Bible college after prison. And I asked them to mail me an application to the only Bible college I had ever heard of, which is in our hometown, Chicago, called Moody Bible Institute. But then there was silence on the other line because I think they both dropped their phones. They mailed the application into me to prison. I quickly filled it out. I was so excited to the questions, to the essays, till I got to the very end of the application where they asked me for references. Not from anybody but specifically people who knew me as a Christian for at least one year. I had some slim pickings in prison. But I was able to persuade a prison chaplain, a prison guard, and another prison inmate to write my references to Moody Bible Institute. <laughs> so the greatest miracle, <laughs> amen, the greatest miracle probably of this whole story is that Moody actually accepted me. 
I was released from prison in July of 2001, and I started the very next month in August of 2001. So imagine the surprise of my classmates when I answered their question, what did you do this summer? <laughs> I graduated from Moody in 2005, went on to get my Master's of Arts in Biblical Exegesis from Wheaton College Graduate School. Um, I'm working on my doctorate of ministry now at Bethel Seminary in St. Paul, Minneapolis. I had the honor of co-authoring a book with my mother called Out of a Far Country, A Gay Son's Journey to God, A Broken Mother's Search for Hope. You know, God has blessed my parents and I with a ministry where we, get, where we get to travel around the nation, around the world, talking about God's grace and God's truth on the issue of sexuality. But you guys ever notice that God has a sense of humor? How many of you guys know God has a sense of humor? Well, God brought me back to Moody where I'm teaching in the Bible department. So I went from prisoner to professor. How about that for a resume? But <laughs> amazingly, but God has done far more abundantly beyond all that we have asked or thought. As I look back upon my life, most of which were far, far apart from Christ, I see a lot of bad decisions with some enormous consequences. One of those being HIV positive. You know, I realize that actually I'm no different than any of you. All of our days are numbered. Not one person in this room has ever been promised tomorrow. Freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, staff. Not one has ever been promised tomorrow. But don't we live with the expectancy of tomorrow? And yet it took getting HIV for me to realize a profound truth that as a child of God I must live with a sense of urgency can I tell you guys something this world we live in today with wars, famines, shootings in schools and in malls, our government shutting down, orphans, widows. As we look around the world today, I am fully convinced that this world does not need another good Christian. Christian who might go to church every Sunday with their parents, Maybe even go to good Christian school. In the eyes of man, good people. But in the eyes of God, doing little for the kingdom of heaven. As I look at the world around us, on media, around the world, locally, nationally, internationally, I've come to the realization that this world doesn't need another good Christian. But what this world needs, actually what this world demands, are great Christians. Christians who won't settle for mediocrity. Christians who don't care what the person on the right says or what the person on the left says, but they're living for an audience of one. Christians who know that they must live with a sense of urgency. Christians who know that they've been crucified with Christ and they no longer live, but Christ lives in them. Christians who know that today might be their last. We have all been given but one day and one, one life and one life alone to give glory to God. Are you living your life for God? Or are you just give, living day by day? Waking up, eating, going to sleep, doing your homework, going back to bed God did not create us to simply take up space in this world 
and just waste our time. God created you. God created me to give all glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. Because I don't know how many years the good Lord has given to me or will give to me. But I've prayed for one thing, one thing alone. And that is in my life, I might be able to see with my eyes this generation rise up and take their place in this world and turn it upside down for the sake of Christ. Because 2,000 years ago, it took a handful of simple women and men, and they changed the course of history forever. Do you want to just simply be a part of history, or do you want to create history for the glory of God? Because whether you're ready or not, every one of us, every one of us in this room, in the blink of an eye, will one day stand before our God, our Creator. And my hope is that he'll look at you in the eye and say, well done, good and faithful servant. Let's pray. O God of the universe, creator of all that was, is, and will be. You are enthroned in the heavens, and you reign over all. You are the King of kings, the Lord of lords. You are mighty above all creation, and we worship you this morning, O God. And in your glory and majesty, you have allowed us broken people to call you Abba, Papa. Father, thank you that you have called us each by name. And yet we have often settled for mediocrity. We have given in to just the ways of the world and just caught, get caught up in our schedule day by day by day and wasted this day you've given to us. Oh God, forgive us. Help us to live for you and be great. Not in man's eyes. Not to lord over them and say, look at how great I am. But in your eyes, oh God. Great just right where we're at, making a difference one life at a time. God, we pray for a revival, and we know that a revival begins with one. Might that revival begin right now in our hearts today. We praise you. We thank you. And we ask this in the powerful, precious name of Jesus, the Messiah, and the people of God. Grace.